Good morning, everyone, and praise the Lord. This is Pastor Mike, Senior Pastor of For God's Glory Ministries. It is truly an honor and a privilege and a joy to be with you yet again through the digital platform, live on Facebook, in order to listen to, to watch, to enjoy, to sup at the table of the Lord and learn from his word. Thank you so much for all of you that have been supportive throughout this time. We believe that we've made a difference. We believe that we are providing a service for those who cannot get out to church due, due to the COVID-19 situation. We are so grateful to God to, for providing this opportunity, for providing this platform. And we're so grateful to you, all of you that have continued to watch, continue to share uh, with others in terms of your Facebook links. We are really, really so grateful. Those of you who have let us know that the word is making a difference in your life and that we are doing God's work, that we are benefiting the Lord's purposes. Thank you so much for all of that. And we're grateful to know that so many are tuning in from so many places. And I don't want to leave anybody out, but I know last week I left out my Palmdale Lancaster brothers and sisters. Nobody told me that, but I thought about it afterwards. And you guys are so important to us. Many of you are actually our blood family or, or family through marriage, and you matter so much. Your support, uh, your caring, your love, it matters tremendously to us that are in this ministry for God's glory ministry, and we want God to be glorified. Well, before we go into the word, let's have a brief moment of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to see another day. Lord God, this is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we thank you for our life, our health and our strength. We thank you, Lord God, that we're in our right mind, that we can actually take in your word today and hear it and prayerfully understand it. Lord God, we ask that you would take this word today and plant it into our hearts, Lord God. Plant it deep and water it, Lord God. We hope that our hearts will be open, our minds will be open, so that the seed can take root and begin to blossom in our lives. Lord God, we can do nothing without you. We honor you. We glorify you. We welcome you into our presence, into this session. And we ask, Lord God, that you would touch each and every person exactly where they need to be touched. We pray this prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, friends, today we're going to talk about a very serious topic for serious Christians. You could even call this topic, this subject, deep. And even if you're still on a journey, seriously searching for God, but have not yet found him, this message is for you as well. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Some translations would say knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. But to revere God and to be in awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the first step in obtaining wisdom. And as long as you have that approach, that perspective toward God, then not only is it the beginning of wisdom, as you continue to think that way, as you continue to approach God that way, wisdom continues to come to you. It piles on and you get to live your best life. And not only do you live your best life now, but you get to fully begin your life that doesn't end because you continue on into eternity. And getting to know God Getting to understand him is one of the most potent tools in your tool belt to walk this walk of faith. So if we know God's true nature, I truly believe that he will, we will revere him and we will be in awe of him. To know God is to love him. 
To know God is to revere him, to respect him, to really know him. Once you really know him, oh, you can't help but be in awe of our mighty God. Now, in order to help us to do that, I believe that it's useful for us to begin at the beginning, and that is creation. Now, our goal here is to reintroduce you to God, maybe for some, introduce you to God but therefore allowing us to know God better. And this should increase our faith and strengthen our commitment to his purposes. Now, to do this, let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. This will not be hard to find. It doesn't matter what version of the Bible you're looking at. It doesn't matter... How big it is or small it is, we will find this in the same place. Go all the way to the front of your Bible, the very first book, and actually the very first verse. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In order to get to know God better, in order to know his essence, in order to know why he is worthy of being revered and for us to be in awe of him. This is a great place to go. Genesis, Genesis 1 and verse 1. And it reads this way. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We've probably all heard that. Oh, we read it and we keep on going. It's just the beginning of the Bible, right? But in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. A couple of things that we learn here. First of all, God's creation, as far as we are concerned, comes in essentially two categories. There is the earth, this globe, this big rock that we get to live on that God has fashioned perfectly for our existence. Our job is to keep it that way. But our globe, and you could say maybe the, 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 the lower parts of the sky where it's rich in oxygen, our atmosphere, it was designed for our thriving, our existence, for us to do well in. And then there's everything else, the rest of the sky and all of the cosmos, all of our universe. So that is the heavens and our earth. But what I want to draw your attention to this morning is that word created. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, as I just described it, that's a whole lot of creation. But God created is what I want to point to. Because what this word created actually means is he brought it into being. He brought the heaven and the earth, into existence. And I want to make sure that we all understand that this act, this very act of bringing something into existence distinguishes God above all. It separates him from anyone else that could claim to be God, could claim to have any power, could claim to have any tremendous abilities. It is only God that can make something out of absolutely nothing. It is only God that has this distinguishing characteristic of the ability, the power, to actually create. Now, man would fashion himself to be creative, and there's no question we do what we call create things. We really, what we really do is we, we rearrange, we intermingle, we shape, we refashion what God has already created. Man doesn't make something out of nothing. Anything that we create comes from the basic ingredients that God provided us in the first place. And so, again, the most important thing here to grasp is this distinguishing characteristic that should cause us to begin to be in complete awe of God, including his creation of us. Now, looking at a few more verses in this creation story, verse 2 through, say, 5, 
And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. Now, God, the only one who can create, said, let there be light. So what do you think happens when God says, let there be light? I'm sure you got the question right. And that is, if God says, let there be light, there's going to be light. <laughs> and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, if this was going to be about the entire creation, we would keep going. But we're not going to keep going. This is really enough for us to grasp what we need to grasp. And that is that there is this distinguishing, awe-inspiring characteristic of God, Yahweh. He's the only one that can create something out of nothing. The other characteristic, the other point that we want to get from these verses is this thing that we see here in verse 3. And God said, God spoke the light into existence. Now I know that many of us as Christians will say we speak things into existence. There's no question life and death are in the power of the tongue, but I just want you to be really aware that when you read those verses, it's talking about a court environment. It's talking about someone bearing witness in a court, and one could be sentenced to death based on your lips, or someone could be spared because of your testimony. And so when we talk about speaking something directly into existence, I don't mean indirectly like what our lips can fashion through someone else's ultimate actions. We're talking about only God can take absolutely nothing and make it into something. And the fact that God said is going to matter as we understand his essence, as we understand his character, as we get to know him better and understand why we should be in awe, why we should reverence him, why we should invite him and let him lead us in our lives. Now, in order to further this understanding, we're going to move away from this beginning of the Genesis creation story, and we're going to go to the New Testament. And so if you will turn to the book of John, that is the Gospel of John, it will be the fourth book in your New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And we're going to be starting from the beginning, just as with Genesis. Hopefully you have it at this time. And we're going to be looking at the first two verses just to get started. Remember, we just looked at the beginning of the creation story, and we understand that God creates something from nothing. And we also understand that he spoke, and then it was. He spoke it, and then it happened. Awesome, unique characteristic of God. So John 1 and 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, my friends, whenever you read this particular verse or these particular verses, what you can do is you can plug in everywhere you see word, by the way, it's capitalized. There's a reason for that. Everywhere you see the word, you can plug in Jesus. You can also, if you wanted to, you could plug in the son of God or the son. And whenever we see the word God here, it's talking about the father. It's talking about Yahweh. And so to read it again and to plug that in for us to get the full essence of it, the full meaning, in the beginning was Jesus. So he was there in the very beginning. 
and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. That's powerful. In the beginning was Jesus, and the beginning, and in the beginning, the word, meaning Jesus, was with God, with the Father, and Jesus was God. You know, we serve a triune God, a singular God, but he is the Father, he is also the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's made up of all three aspects, all three components. And the same was in the beginning, meaning Jesus was in the beginning with God. So what we learn here is that Jesus was there from the very beginning. So we don't have to wonder, well, when did Jesus show up? He was there from the very beginning. Very important. Remember, we've distinguished God as the only true creator. We've also pointed out that God makes these things come into existence with his voice, with his speaking it. Amen? Now, let's go to verse 3. Very, very, very important verse. And it says, all things. Now, how many things? All things. Which things? All things were made by him. Now, we're still talking about Jesus here. We're still talking about the word. We're still talking about the son of God. We are in awe of God. We're coming to understand and know him, which will give us understanding, more understanding. And to be in awe of him, to revere him, is the beginning of wisdom, which we need to walk this walk. And so we come to understand here in John 1 and 3 that all things, that means Every single thing was made by Jesus. And without Jesus was not even one single thing. The Bible says anything, meaning not even one single thing was made. Uh, it, let's see, it says without him was not one single thing made that was made. And when we look at this word made, we can actually change that over to create or created. So all things were created. All things were brought into existence by Jesus. And without Jesus was not any single thing created that was created. This is a powerful thing to understand. What we're talking about here is the Father's will, the Father's design, the Father's plan, but implemented by, brought to us, made manifest by, and through Jesus. Oh, that's powerful. Nothing was created without Jesus. Even if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, it doesn't say there that God said, let there be the heaven and the earth. But what we do know is as we keep reading, we see that the writer lets us know that God spoke these things into existence. What we see now is that even the heaven and the earth part did not happen without Jesus. Super, super powerful. Jesus was there from the very beginning. And he was active from the very beginning. And he was critical from the very beginning. We are seeing more and more as we come to be respectful of God, when we come to be in awe of God, we are seeing that we must invest that belief, invest that commitment, invest that awe in both the Father and the Son. Unbelievably important to understand this. So this formula or this relationship between the Father and the Son comes up over and over again in the Gospels. Jesus did everything that he could to explain this. He said it in various different ways over and over again. But the people in the, in, in the early days, the people when Jesus was walking this earth and that we read in the Gospels, they struggled to embrace it, to understand it. 
And we, even now, after all this time, often struggle to understand this duality, this relationship between the Father and the Son, which has been from the beginning and before the beginning as we know it. But it's powerful to have a grasp on this. So we now understand that God has this unique capacity for creation, and it should trigger, it should inspire awe and reverence in us. And so that's how we can really put these things together with Proverbs 9 and 10. Yes, even if you look at Proverbs 9 and 10, by the way, where it says the holy, some would translate it the holy one, guess what? That word is plural. Now, how can that be? Well, let's just say I told you, you are going to win the championship. Well, who am I saying that to? Well, I could be saying it to anyone, but what if I'm saying it to the Los Angeles Clippers? What if I'm saying it to the Milwaukee Bucks? Well, I just said you, but it turned out to be plural. But I could also say that you are going to be the CEO of the company one day. Well, by the context, I'm talking to an individual, and so therefore, it's singular. But the point here is that when we see there that to, to know the holy is understanding, to know the holy one is understanding, by definition, if you grasp that, you've got to be talking about the father and the son for sure at a minimum. So this is critical for us to understand. But unfortunately, our perspective on Jesus, as you can see here, we're really trying to make sure that we understand the essence of the Father and the Son. Because it is too easy, and it happens too often, that who Jesus really is, the Holy One, is somewhat diminished, not fully understood and embraced. And I think that partly this is because our perspective on Jesus is influenced tremendously by the fact that we come to know him first as a man. We are introduced to Jesus based on what he did on earth, based on that he had a body that bled on the cross. The fact that he had, he was the result of a virgin birth and an, an immaculate conception. And even that, to be honest, which we celebrate each year, can cause a diminishment of our view of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because we are reminded each year that at one point he was a baby. We're reminded each year, and some remind themselves daily or at least weekly, that he is the son of a virgin called Mary. These are the things that are huge parts of our introduction to Jesus. And so we know him first for what he did as a man, the fact that he was a man, and we don't first get introduced to him by the fact that he is God. We don't get introduced to him by the fact that he is the creator. We don't get introduced to him by understanding that he was there from the beginning and nothing came to be without him. So this introduction can impact, influence our perspective on him. And that can cause us not to embrace him for who he really is and be in awe of him and know that he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our honor. He's worthy of giving our lives as a living sacrifice and following his lead and listening to what he has to say. So once you know God properly, and now we have the essence of this understanding and the relationship between the Father and the Son and their oneness in the Godhead. It should be no surprise at all that the Father had a plan for salvation. He designed a way for us to be recovered, reclaimed from our sinful failure, which leads only to death and that eternal. The Father's plan for salvation came out of his mind, his heart. Well, guess what? It should be no surprise 
that it was brought to fruition by and through Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? The Father's plan from the Father's mind and heart, but come to fruition, made real for us and to us through and by the Son, Jesus Christ. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's look at verses 4 and 5 very quickly. We're still talking about Jesus. In him was life. We understand this. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, this is important. This word chosen is comprehend, but it really means overcome. The light of Jesus shines in the darkness. The light of Jesus shines on us and allows us to realize in the light of day that we are sinful and we need a savior, that we blow it all the time just like Adam and Eve did and we need a solution because we don't want to go to hell. We don't want to have to live out our eternity that way because that kind of living isn't living. That's spiritual death. Amen? And so... He is life, and the life was the light of men. And the, when the light shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot overcome the light. That is the point. Whenever there is light shining on a situation, light shining in a life, light shining from a light, darkness cannot overcome it. Where there is light and dark, ultimately light always wins. Try shining a light in any environment and tell me whether you can have darkness. You can't have darkness where there is light. So Jesus is the life and his, he's, that life is the light of men. So when we allow Jesus into our life, when we allow that light to shine in our life, to recognize what we really are and whose we really are and who we need in order to be successful in this life and eternally, when that light is allowed to come in, it always overcomes the darkness. So if you've recognized that there is darkness in your life, and it's true for all of us, all you have to do is let that light come in. It cannot be defeated. It cannot be overcome. It cannot be overwhelmed. It's literally impossible. And that is a beautiful thing to know. As we learn more and more about Jesus, as we learn more and more about the Son, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, let's skip on down to verse 10, where it says, still talking about Jesus, still talking about our Savior, but still talking about God, the Son. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and we really understand this now, don't we? And the world knew him not. I mean, that's mind-blowing. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Imagine being the creator and not being recognized for your creation. Has that ever happened? You actually did something. You actually made something. And somebody else gets the credit. Or at a minimum, you don't get the credit. So being the creator and not recognized for your creation, that's a terrible thing. And yet Jesus, that was his situation when he was here on earth. Or being the creator and not being recognized by your very own creation. He created us. And then he came and dwelt among us and we did not recognize him. And I don't mean physically, but we should have recognized his character. We should have recognized his love. We should have recognized his approach, but we didn't because we took the Bible and we made religion or we took God's word. We took his guidance in, from the Old Testament and we made it into religion. Religion isn't all bad, but when man's in charge of it, it often goes bad. And that's how we end up failing Proverbs 9 and 10. That's how we end up failing to be in awe of God, reverencing him for who and what he really is. And this happens to all too many people who are searching for God. 
they run into religion. They run into people organizing and, and fashioning religion. Again, nothing wrong with religion, but boy, when imperfect man is in charge, things happen. Things can go bad. That's not always the, the best representation of God. But our job is to embrace our relationship with God and therefore know that he deserves and all of the people that he's attempting to reach deserve us to be our very best. And to do that, you've got to embrace God for who he is. You've got to come to know God for who he really is. And we don't have to fail the Proverbs 9 and 10 test. We can have the wonderful wisdom that allows us to live our best lives. Let's look at verse 11 very quickly. It reads, he came unto his own, that means the Jews in this case, and his, and his own received him not. The Jews should have been looking for Jesus. They were looking for a Messiah, but they didn't recognize Jesus, and so they rejected him. They did not receive him. They were looking for something else. They just wanted to throw off the shackles of the Roman domination. They wanted a human, earthly, secular leader to deliver them from their secular bondage. They didn't understand that what they needed was a spiritual deliverance. They thought that repeatedly doing, making the sacrifices on the altar, they thought that that was enough. They thought that all the rituals and traditions of the temple were enough. And all of that failure repeatedly to have to go back over and over again asking for forgiveness was a sign. It was to let us know that there is no way that we can do it on our own. And so that's why Jesus came to be the ultimate sacrifice, the final sacrifice. So now let's read, let's keep continue reading and read verses 12 and 13. It says, but as many as have received him, that is received Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That is beautiful. The authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, as we come to know God, how critical it is we've got to come to the Father by Jesus. We've got to go through Jesus to get to the Father. There's no doubt about that. So it's critical to understand the deity of Christ. And so he gives us the power, the authority. When we receive him, we can then become the adopted sons of God the Father. It says, which were born not of the blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. In other words, it doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter your last name. It doesn't matter your color. It doesn't matter your nationality or place of origin. It doesn't matter how much money you have or don't have. None of these earthly things matter. Not born of the blood, of, of, the, of the blood, not born of the will of the flesh because somebody decided that you would be born, not born of the will of men, but of God. When we are reborn, when we are born again, the origins are of God. It is the will of God that we've embraced, the will of God for our lives, the solution accepted allows us to be born in the only way that ultimately matters because our first birth was damned. Our first birth was an automatic failure in eternity. And so all that we have to do is receive this light. All that we have to do is accept Jesus and he gives us the authority to be sons of the Father. That is so awesome. Because we are born here of God. That is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let's go to verse 14. We're still talking about Jesus. It says, and the word. So we plug in, right? Jesus and Jesus and the son of God. And the word was made flesh. So remember, we're still talking about the same word that's in verse 1 of this chapter in John, right? 
and the same word that was in Genesis 1 and 1, right? So the same Jesus that was there from the very beginning. So, and Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Now, your Bible may have something in parentheses, and you all know that that means it was added for clarity. And I know it says, and we behold his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. That's nice, but always know that you should be able to read any verse, and it should make sense without what's in the parentheses. So, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Now, what we want to glean from this particular verse is that is Jesus, it says, was made flesh. Now, to get the full, accurate essence of this, we need to take this terminology that said the word was made flesh. It makes it sound like it could have been fashioned into flesh. And no, it means he became flesh. Now, to get this right, you have to know who Jesus is, who Jesus has been from the very beginning. So the one who made everything manifest that was ever made, the one who brought everything into existence, the one who no creation could happen without, he became flesh. So he was always God. And he became also man because he had to in order to suffer for us. He now had an aspect that could die, so the body could die. That was necessary to be a legitimate sacrifice because there is no remission of sins unless there is a shedding of blood. But he was the ultimate Passover lamb. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He became flesh. But it's important for us to grasp this because he was still God and he's always been God. He didn't come here as a man and then get resurrected and, and glorified and suddenly became God sitting at the right hand of the Father. He has always been God. And he became flesh. This is critical for us to understand about our Savior. And so finally, we go to verse 18, where it says, and this, this really creates a crescendo of our understanding of the Holy One. No man has seen God at any time. So now we can understand this. It's saying no man has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son, that is Jesus, of course, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. This doesn't mean he came and said out loud with his mouth that God exists. He didn't come to proclaim God. Declared him means he manifested him. When you see Jesus, you are seeing God. When they saw Jesus, they were seeing God, but they couldn't get past the flesh. Just like we sometimes can't get past the fact that we're introduced to Jesus as a man. Rather than being introduced to him in the proper chronology of what he has been. He was God first before he became man. So Jesus is the reflection of God. Jesus is, the, is what allows us to envisage God. We've never seen the Father, but Jesus manifested him. He came as God, and he expressed God's character, and he explained God's solution, and he made that solution real. It was God the Father's plan and architecture and design, but it was Jesus' execution. So you see how critical it is what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you see how critical it is that flesh that he became, how it fought against him just like it does us? But he pressed through it because he had a purpose. He pressed through it because he would have done it for any single one of us, and yet he did it for all of us. But he had to do so. He had to follow through. He had to press through what the flesh that he had become was doing to him. 
And so as we understand God and we understand Jesus as God, we cannot diminish the role of Jesus, nor can we deny his deity if we ever expect to know God and if we ever expect to pursue godly wisdom. So we'll end where we began, Proverbs 9 and 10. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It is the first step, being in awe of God, understanding who he really is, revering him, embracing him, being willing to follow him is the beginning and obey him, the beginning of wisdom. It's the first step in wisdom. And as we continue to think that way, function that way, it brings more wisdom and it brings our best life. And going back to Proverbs 9 and 10, and the knowledge of the holy, or the knowledge of the holy one is understanding. You can't approach this. You can't have this. You can't claim this. You can't embrace this. You can't walk in this and forget about Jesus. So we want you to walk in this. And we want you to never, ever, ever forget about Jesus, who he really is, and what he really did for us. So hopefully, my friends, your faith is now stronger and your commitment is now greater for God's purposes as you walk through this life because we now understand God better. My prayer is that this word has touched you. My prayer is that this word has empowered you. All of you serious Christians, this is a serious and deep and important topic. And if you came to this message wandering or wondering, if you came to us today looking for God, wondering where is he, trying to break through the wall of religion and sometimes hurt and disappointment through mere mortals that attempt to represent him. We're trying to do our best, but our best is not always good enough. But today you've been introduced in a very unique and special way to the God of the universe. And hopefully now you understand how powerful it is, how critical it was, how amazing it was that the creator of the universe, knowing that he would not be recognized, knowing that he would not be properly credited, chose to become flesh so that he could reclaim us. My friend, if you came here looking, and through this word, your heart has been pierced, and now you feel found, then happy birthday to you. If you're ready to embrace Jesus into your heart, that only in one manifestation of God the Father that we get to experience, then my friends, today is your day. Happy birthday to you. You get the opportunity at a rebirth. You get to be born again, not of the will of man. Maybe your parents didn't plan you, and here you are. God planned you. Now, he didn't want you to be stuck with sin. He didn't want you to be bound with that, but now that you are, he also planned to reclaim you, and he paid the price for that. If you accept that, if you're willing to accept that light into your heart, into your life today, then all you have to do is say that in your mind or say that with your mouth. It's even better with your mouth. Admit to God that you recognize that you're lacking something. You recognize that you're sinful like the rest of us, but that you're not going to be stuck with that sin into eternity. And you accept him into your heart. You accept him into your life. You accept him as your Lord and Savior, your God, your leader, your provider, your counselor. Happy birthday. So my friends, I pray that this word has been special to you. 
It was certainly special for me to have the privilege and the opportunity to prepare it and to deliver it. I hope that, and I pray, and I expect that God will bless me to come up with just as good a word, just as important a message for us the same time next week in the same place. And so my friends, may God be with you as you go through the rest of your week. And I want to say just a brief moment of prayer. I feel led to do this before we close out. Father God, thank you so much for such a wonderful session in your word. Thank you for showing up and showing out. I know that your presence is being felt in every single locale, in every single place. I know that you're there with every single person that's listening and watching to this today. Thank you, God, for being faithful. Thank you, God, for being true. Thank you, God, for being who you are and helping us to know you better. Thank you, Lord. We glorify you. We praise you. We give you the honor. In Jesus' name. So, my friends, have a wonderful week. And until next time, may the Lord richly bless you in a way that only he knows how. <laughs>